placings in brilliant prose across many titles, including London Overground, London Orbital, and Downriver. The trope of the journey informs other extraordinary works. The Edge of the Orison, the basis for the film By Ourselves, shadowing the poet John Clare's escape and journey from an asylum in Epping Forest to his home in Northamptonshire in search of his beloved, who had died three years before. The film features Toby Jones, his father, Freddie Jones, Alan Moore and Ian, sometimes in a goat mask. Do watch it. It's a film of enormous beauty and pathos and humour. Many of you will be familiar with Ian's book based on the talk he gave to the Swedenborg Society, Blake's London, the topographic sublime, a walking tour de force through contemporary London, which ends with these lines. The golden chain goes on and on, and the words of guidance, the maps we need to follow, are all to be found in the works of the archetypal London writer, William Blake of Lambeth. Ian's new book, The Gold Machine, in the tracks of the mule dancers, continues to follow those maps, that golden chain, or sometime golden string, tracing his great grandfather's footsteps across Sri Lanka, Peru, and Tasmania. Ian's great grandfather's journal and a great wealth of literary texts from Conrad to Geoffrey Hill are recontextualized and transformed by the alchemy of his writing and his journeying into sublime prose, as in his own words, before I could start where he, my great grandfather finished and write my way back to him, I would need to uncover some part of who and what he once was. Ian, uh, the, very, the very warmest of welcomes. Reading The Gold Machine has already made me re-envision the mental traveler in ways I, I'd never done before. Please do crack the secret code for us. Oh. <laughs> I am now unmuted. I can, I can not only listen to your very generous and inspiring introduction. Um, I almost feel I should go back and read some of these books. It was, it was intriguing to hear them positioned because that's what I'd like to do now. Um, you, you mentioned the mental traveler, which hit me as a probably a 14 or 15 year old. And in a way that I didn't understand then, but I, I responded to. And I think this is the most significant thing to do with poetry, which is, you do not need to understand, but you need to experience. And through that experience, eventually, hopefully, you will understand in a new way. Um, because all of your life flows into these markers that you pick up at an early stage. And of the many Blake poems that were around, this particular one, misunderstood, but inspiring, set up everything that I was going to do. Um, this is from the, the fair copy from the Fickering Manuscript, The Mental Traveler. I traveled through a land of men, a land of men and women too, and heard and saw such dreadful things as cold earth wanderers never knew. What I discovered from that and what became the kind of map of everything that I would do subsequently is that this poem contained three elements, shape, movement, and place. These are the, these are the elements of um, the poetry that meant most to me. Shape is interesting. It's not, I don't mean that in a sense of um, a typographical design. Um, this would have been a, a handwritten poem. Um, Blake was a marvellous shaper onto the page, obviously, the margins coming alive with images and illustrations often, the script sometimes hard to see. But what I felt with this poem when I looked at it was it was a kind of column that was pinched and squeezed as if by some growing vine that wrapped itself round it. 
which later would reveal itself to be a, a DNA spiral. It's the most mysterious poem um, and a cyclic poem. The element that gets me first in terms of its shape is this idea that Blake himself had of opening yourself up to a kind of genetic possession in the way that he did with Milton. When he's at Felpham, he sees the star breakdown, the, the star of Mel Milton's laser talent piercing his heel and uh, allowing him to then engage with and even remake Milton's great paradise poems. So um, I'm not saying that anything that I did was on, on even remotely the same level, but it was a sense of just opening up a series of genetic exchanges with the poem, letting the poem begin to wrap like a vine and squeeze on my spine and become part of the system that was of a, a single man, but would become also part of a system of that man trying to understand and move through a city. The poem had all of those qualities. The, the, the ostensible explanation of the poem, um, which is quite convincingly argued by Foster Damon, is that it is about it's a, a sort of allegory of liberty and revolution. And that um, they have this ever shifting engagement with each other um, between male and female elements. And all of that stands up pretty well, but it, it doesn't to me get to the ultimate fire sources of the poem, which seem to be a huge, um, sexual, political intertwining, a sort of Jungian argument that is uh, haunting in all kinds of ways. The, the idea just going on, for there the babe is born in joy. This, this could be a version of Orc, the, 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 the revolutionary animus of the city. We're begotten in dire woe, just as we reap in joy the fruit which we in bitter tears did so. But when we go on from that into the next section, this, this is when I began to see glimmerings of um, some kind of future illumination. And if the babe is born a boy, he's given to a woman old who nails him down upon a rock, catches his shrieks in cups of gold. And with these cups of gold, the gold is, is, is a, a glint. It's a, a vein that's running, running through the poem. His fingers number every nerve, just as a miser counts his gold. And I think there is an underlying metaphor of alchemy within this, through cyclic repetition, through process, that will emerge in a sense, taking you on the Homeric journey to complete and to come back to where you were at the beginning, but to have had all of your your molecules rearranged, your intelligence fired, your veins throbbing. You, you are a kind of new entity by the time you come to the end of it. And the idea of the journey, the movement, was very important to me. Um, it, the, the, the very first element of being a traveler uh, that's, that's offered up at the beginning of the poem was a sort of family tradition that was haunting me. And again, I hadn't been able to deal with it of um, the only family records I had on my father's side of the family was a great grandfather who had grown up in um, the Highlands inland from Aberdeen in a, in a very impoverished uh, village. Uh, the family um, in a bad place after the Jacobite uprising, um, in land enclosures. Um, and being forced to uh, leave school at the age of 10 and, as he put it, commence his education and, and become a, a world traveller. So sort of the, the condition of Scottishness was to feel at home everywhere except in Scotland. In, the, in this, this is around eight, 1850, uh, 1856, my great grandfather left England, um, a four and a half month journey by sea to get to Ceylon, as was then, where he becomes something of an expert on planting and growing and soil and, and works there until he's 40 and then thinks he has enough saved and put aside to return to Scotland and, and become a writer. 
And so this, this germ of being having to write was with me. Um, and the second germ of having to travel and roam endlessly was completely scaled down. I was never a, a world traveler in the way that my great grandfather was, or even my grandfather, his son, who was as a young man was a ship's doctor. Um, I, my travels were basically held to the, to the gravity of London and its fringes. But nevertheless, uh, in a sort of comic way, hacking down the A13 became like pushing down the Amazon in this book I was reading. And at the back of it all, again, still is this underlying image that something there in Mental Traveller is a kind of map of how to proceed in the world and how to chart my own uh, inspirations and the way I should work. Earlier on, before that, before this, this particular poem set everything up for me, uh, the only Blakes you know, I knew were those, those poems from Songs of Innocence, uh, obviously the tiger, um, fearful symmetry seems to fit very nicely with this idea of shape, which I see essential to all of this, and, and also uh, movement in the sense that the tiger felt like a Douanier Rousseau tiger. It felt like in Blake's own drawing, it felt as if it was something that would emerge from the plant house in Kew Gardens and move on a trajectory into the, the industrialized London of Lambeth and into the river, which was always the sense of movement. So, so there was tiger and, and most haunting was um, sick rose, which I associated very closely with the poet who was geographically closest to me and who I read most intensely at that time, who was Dylan Thomas. And Dylan Thomas is forced that through the green fuse drives the flower, drives my green age, that blasts the roots of trees is my destroyer, and I am dumb to tell the crooked rose. My youth is bent by the same wintry fever. That to me was very, very reminiscent and echoing on and drawing on Blake's sick rose, a oh, rose art sick, the invisible worm that flies in the night in his howling storm has found out thy bed of crimson joy and his dark secret love does thy life destroy. Uh, so I guess those, those two like, um, not quite nursery songs, but like songs infiltrated me and they were there on, on a different level, on a different place to Mental Traveller. But they kept coming back. They were almost the rhythm of walking. Oh, Rose, art sick. Every time I felt ill, that sort of came into my head. And it was the, the Rosicrucian rose. It was, it was the rose of enlightenment that was being challenged and picked at, as well as being a, a, a sense of the prophecies of ecological doom that were haunting us already. And the third poem, of that group that was in my head early was our sunflower. And this, this uh, really, really opened a gate. And I love the way that Blake's title is, ah, exclamation mark, sunflower with a hyphen. It's a sunflower, a flower of the sun. It's, um, it's much more than itself. It's much more than it appears to be. Our sunflower, weary of time, Countess the steps of the sun, um, all of that made the situation ripe that when in 1967, I've mentioned this many times, but it's, it's important to me and to what I'm trying to say now, was the presence of Allen Ginsberg, who was a great Blakeian in London for the Congress of the Dialectics of Liberation, and the chance I had to make my first documentary film, engaging with him, and most importantly, spending a morning sitting on top of Primrose Hill with this poet who was wearing this bright red silk shirt that had been hand painted by Paul McCartney, and him feeling that this was a, this was a moment of energies opening up in England. And not only that, by sitting on the top of the hill, there was this wonderful panorama of the city. Um, we sat there and he he remembered Crab Robinson uh, um, saying he'd, he'd seen Blake as a, a spiritual son on top of Primrose Hill. And uh, Harry Fainlight, the poet, 
came along and joined him at that moment. And it, Ginsburg was very taken with the new, newish structure of the, the post office tower, which he, he called a sort of thorned tower. And the shape of that tower is again, a bit like the shape of the mental traveler. He didn't realize, I think, and I didn't mention it, that Rambo and Verlaine had shared a room right, right at the foot of where the post office tower now is. But I think he saw it as a kind of a combination of a, a radio energy, almost anticipating the, the world of the internet, the ultimate series of interconnections. And at the same time as a kind of phallic monument, maybe a phallic monument to, to Rambo. And those, uh, the image of that thorn tower, as he described it, moved across into his, one of his most Blakeian poems, which was Wales, A Visitation, when in the middle of our filming, he took himself off to Llantoni Abbey in Wales, which I would come to write about sometime later, and went to the top of the hill and had a sort of ecstatic LSD vision, which he describes this floating, misted, lammy landscape in, in Blakeian terms. But what was most important to him was his Blake vision when he lived alone in East Harlem before this, and he heard the, the voice of William Blake, this grave voice, reciting the poem, Our Sunflower, uh, which led him into a period of in, intense reading of Blake, and um, intriguingly engaging with English poets, some, some of whom were in New York. He met, he met the poet George Barker, um, and later in Paris, he, he met Don Moray's. There's something in common with both those people. They'd both been first published by um, David Archer, great patron of poets, Parton Press, running Parton Bookshop, also published David Gascoigne and Sidney Graham. And Ginsberg and Corso were invited to England to go to Oxford to read by Don Moraes, and they meet in London when they're penniless on the street. They, they manage to find out where David Archer is, and he's not so well off himself at that time, but he raises some money for them. So there's a kind of connection. There's a sort of mysterious series of interconnections between these poets, both American and English. And what Ginsburg told me then was um, he was very engaged by the way that the poet George Barker had written in Calamitera, his, his poem in the 1930s, um, about Blake and about a, a vision of Blake on the Thames at Sonning near Reading, that, that, that Barker was there with his brother Kit, who was a painter, and when I researched it, I found that what they had been reading intensely together was Mental Traveller. So I uh, did manage to find myself a copy of Kelamitera, which is a, a nice first edition. And I was a book dealer, so these things were possible. And I came to read it on the, in, on the instructions of Allen Ginsberg. And this is now an English poem um, by somebody who's um, interested in traditional ideas of shape and structure, but is also being published by T.S. Eliot and is engaged with, with modernism and who has this very authentic, I think, vision of William Blake. It was on Sunday, the 12th April, I saw the figure of William Blake, bright and huge, hung over the Thames at Sonning. I had not had this. Familiar with spatial mathematic, acknowledging the element of matter, I was acquainted with the make of things, but not this. I had not acknowledged this. I had not encountered prototype. I saw William Blake, large and bright like ambition, absolute, glittering, actual and gold. I saw he had worlds and worlds in his abdomen and his bosom innumerably impeopled with all birds. I saw his soul like a cinema in each of his eyes and Swedenborg laboring like a dream in his stomach. I remember the myrtle spouting from his hand and saw myself the minor bird on the bow. I recognized the cosmology of objects 
the contributing and constituting things which contemplated too close make a chaos, the glorious plethora, the paradise mass, the chaos of glory in which the idiot wanders collecting. I recognize the cosmology of chaos, observing that the condition rendering chaos, cosmos, is the eternal fact. I recognized the cosmology of chaos. I mean, this, this was a uh, ringing a lot of future bells for me because when the opportunity came up from Picador Books to, to do an anthology, and I suggested an anthology of, of poets, the significant poets, as I thought of the contemporary world, but each of these poets or some of the poets would also be allowed to make the connection to the poets, the lineage of poets from previous generations who had meant most to them. And the book was called Conductors of Chaos. And, and I see that that's kind of a significant element echoing in George Barker. And more than that, this line, uh, I saw William Blake large and bright like ambition, absolute, glittering, actual, and gold. Absolute and gold, you know, glittering. Um, there it is again, and there it is again, picking up on me. And it seems I couldn't uh, avoid that. And this, this was part of some sort of secret coding, a shape that I was unpicking through movement. Place was always easy. I, I found very early on that, that to write intensely about place, the very piece of ground on which you found yourself was going to lead to movement, was going to lead to shape. Shape was the most difficult for me to achieve. Place was relatively straightforward. I would always find myself moving on lines of energy, ley lines, whatever you want to call them, towards particular places, such as the setup of the Hawksmoor churches around uh, Limehouse, Whitechapel, and on the highway, all, all of that making a pattern, a shape. And, and so, okay, the, that part of it was, was fine. And then the discovery of the poets and how the poets had dealt with this before was all beginning to come together. Um, as well as um, George Barker, his great friend of the same period, um, David Gascoigne, who was most noticeable for um, discovering so much about French literature, living in Paris, helping to introduce surrealism and surrealist thought to England, having the most significant catas catastrophic uh, breakdowns and coming through to vision again. And I was, I was lucky enough to, to know David Gascoigne in his latter years after doing a reading with him after he'd, he'd come out of the hospital on the Isle of Wight, doing a reading together in Essex, in um, Colchester at the university and, and getting to, to know him and to pick up somewhat on his sense of London as um, an animate entity, as an organic entity, which was again the vision of Ginsburg on top of Primrose Hill that this whole city we were watching, this pulsing city was literally alive. The grass was alive. The creatures within the grass were alive. The buildings were alive. The whole, the whole system of energy was there, um, initiating the kind of visions that George Barker had had on the Thames. And Blake was, was really the engine behind so much of that. But um, Gascoigne, when I, when I began to look at what he was doing in this same period, by, by 1969, he was moving towards a, a real crisis, a sort of psychotic crisis, both within his life and within his writing. He, he was reading so intensely in the most uh, abstruse sources. Um, Robert Fraser, in his um, biography of David Gascoigne, describes how he contemplates a Gnostic interpretation of Genesis, a Neo-Blakean scenario, the grand result in tune with mystical and sexual insights of alchemical science would be a golden wedding. The renewed marriage of genders would, he thought, lead to a new age, which he thought was 1969. Um, and it's that marriage of genders, the switching of ages and genders that are part of this 
DNA spiral that cycles round the mental traveler. I have at last fulfilled the purpose of the surrealist movement, he, he said to Penrose, and have achieved super reality through understanding the full meaning of Blake's vision of the marriage of heaven and hell, the upper macrocosm and the lower microcosm. He announced his mission to London. He was suffering a, a crisis, a breakdown. He, he felt that he had to tell this vision to various poets, such as Kathleen Rain, who was sympathetic but was not there in London. When he decides that he's got, he knows that Mary Wilson, the, the Prime Minister's wife, is a verse writer, and maybe she can understand what he wants. He, go, he intends to go to Downing Street, but he ends up outside Buckingham Palace. He gets arrested. He's taken to Horton Hospital in Epsom. And there again, this, this becomes part of the shape of my own journey, because when, when I did a walk around the M25 motorway sometime later, much later, around the, the turn of the millennium, um, we visited this hospital where, where Gascoigne had been held in, in 1969. And of course, this, this sense of the, the madness of, of supposed madness of the inner city was being pushed out all the time to the, to the margins, to the edge of the motorways. And, and uh, Horton Hospital had actually disappeared. That the, the streets at that time were, were full of, of patients who, were, who had been left as care in the community, just wandering, looking for the, the places where they lived for so long. Um, the old graveyard of the people who died there was being dug up and all was being turned into a new kind of Barrett estate. And so, so the, the sense of a lineage going back in London a long way, even to Gascoigne, was being obliterated. And, and, and again, um, I began to think there, there is a map, there, there is a pattern if I can, if I can get to it. And, and the only way I was reaching for it was that every, every time there was a new, new cycle in my own work, in which I could feel like a very old man um, being caught up with the energies and blood being put in a golden cup and drinking and finding yourself new with a new project. Blake seemed to be on hand somewhere from, from the very earliest uh, poems of, around Blood Heat and Suicide Bridge. It was as almost like the, the Ginsberg acoustic voice was, was always there. Um, saying more, more, this is, this is not, you haven't sort of reached the point of, of understanding, you're experiencing, you're beginning to experience, you don't understand, find the shape, find the movement. And so the movement became the, the circling of the um, M25, which was, uh, I thought, a very good metaphor, and it linked up with other things, other projects, one of which was to do with a place as a, as a fixed fixed entity, particularly Abney Park, the the cemetery in um, Stoke Newington, which had never quite decided whether it would be a garden or uh, a burial ground. And I went there repeatedly. I went there first um, when I was a, an art student at the Courtauld Institute. I was thinking this is this is all very pleasant but um, I can't I you know I have a family I can't I can't afford to do this I'm going to have to stop doing this and, and get back to work and um, I walked up to Abney Park to think about all this and, and wandered around and it it was the perfect place for it and it it became a place to a destination and so when I started a, a book called Lights Out for the Territory which was a new way of thinking about how to write about London, um, that, that journey to Abney Park was the start. And I, I decided that um, I, I had to describe this V shape. I'm not quite sure why, uh, but I decided I'd walk to Abney Park and then down to Greenwich University where there was an exhibition I was supposed to see, and then up um, to Chingford on the other side. And, and I, would I would write down in, in a notebook all of the graffiti, all of the the secret writings of the streets that were there in the course of this journey. So there would be a, a book of the city, but it would declare itself. I would be more of an editor than a writer. And that curiously linked up 
later with the gold machine, um, which was the conclusion of all of these things for me. Because um, the, the title, The Gold Machine, comes from a poem by Charles Olson, the American poet, the Black Mountain poet, the open field poet, who wrote this long series of poems called the Maximus Poems, that begin with very, very much in the specifics of place of Gloucester, Massachusetts, of the details of the foundation of that city and how that city faced out onto the, the great depths of the Atlantic and the un, under, underwater mountains and continents that were lost and, and also west to, to the, the fact of America. Um, and Olson later then, then came through into a more lyric and cosmic, cosmological mode at the end of the poem. The poem shuffs off the weight of documentation and moves into a, a Homeric register. And the poem, The Gold Machine, which I heard him read in London in 67, because actually, I, though I didn't know it at the time, he had been staying in the same house as Ginsburg near Regent's Park. And the gold machine begins, I am the gold machine, and now I have trenched out, smeared, occupied with my elongated length, the ugliest passage of all the V. So the V was there. I was gradually uncovering this alphabet. Abney Park Cemetery was, was planted as an alphabet in a sort of Robert Graves, white goddess way, in that the trees that went round the perimeter of the, the burial ground were in alphabetical order. Um, and that's kind of very strange and interesting as a conceit. But I was going back there to find the grave of Edward Calvert. Calvert the engraver was one of the ancients, friend of Samuel Palmer and a, a disciple of William Blake, very much taken with Blake's engravings from Virgil and doing his own versions. Um, slightly more elegant, slightly more sophisticated, as he thought, from the, the raw energy of Blake's versions. So I wanted to establish some kind of contact with um, Calvert, but it proved really very, very difficult to, to locate his grave, which I did do, ultimately. And then I started to read a little about Calvert and came to this wonderful story of Calvert and his wife, going down to Shoreham to stay with Palmer and the community there and explore the Golden Valley. And he travels down with William Blake. And when they get there, because Calvert is married, he's given the best uh, rooms to sleep in and, and Blake is rather shoved out. And he's sitting in the water house, smoking a pipe with um, Palmer's father. And Samuel Palmer has taken the coach back to London. And Blake um, says, I see Palmer coming towards us, walking up the road. And they'll say, no, no, you, you can't see that. He's, he's, he's gone to London. And a couple of moments later, Palmer duly walks through the door because the, the coach has lost a wheel and had an accident and it, it's not going to go. And so this, this bizarre vision is, is told by uh, Calvert, um, who was intrigued by the, by the presence of Blake to a great extent. So much so perhaps that his, his own, one of his own daughters who died, he was buried in Bunhill Fields, I mean, right, right next to, to where William Blake is buried. Whereas he himself was, was up in Abney Park, which became the subject of a, of a sequence I'm working on at the moment. Um, and, uh, I feel the voices there are, are very much engaging with, with this uh, Blakean sense of past and present all interweaving in, in a wonderful way. Uh, and, and so those, those were the elements that were there when I launched off to Peru with my daughter. And it didn't, it didn't strike me immediately. But as we went on, I realized this was not my journey. This, this was a journey between three systems of time. Um, first of all, we had my Scottish great-grandfather who had seen this landscape, um, which had not been explored at all by the Hispanic Peruvians. The, the people from Lima never went there. This is uh, 
really back country or on the banks of the Perenne, where the Ashenica people lived, indigenous people. And they were among the first uh, travelers to, to come and survey this ground. I didn't, I didn't at the time where I began to look into this, understand the, the backstory. Um, it was my, my daughter, Fan, who, who started to do some serious research and discovered that this, this was on contract to the Peruvian Corporation of London, who were in Leadenhall Street and who had been given a vast tranche of land when the Peruvian government reneged on their debts after the War of the Pacific, the war with Chile. And they handed over the railways and the silver mines and this massive amount of land, which they didn't really want, they didn't know what to do with, and said, can you do something with it? And these uh, planters were sent out to see whether this land was suitable for growing coffee. And so the ecstatic sense of the richness of the ground, which my great grandfather portrayed as if it was the Garden of Eden discovered, the incredible fertility, the, the variety of flowers and plants and fruits, the, the possibilities were, were overwhelming. But the negative side of that was that he felt, you know, in a, in a sort of Calvinist Scottish way, that this must be put to good use that the indigenous people were, were innocents and they, they had not made any great use of this, so they should be invited to disappear further into the forest or else to, to come, and, um, come into modernity by working on a coffee plantation, which was horrendously wrong, obviously. But, but the vision side of it was equally strong. I mean, I, I wouldn't deny that. So you have, you have his vision of this being an Edenic place um, at the back of it, there was also a sense that he'd, he'd failed. He was he when he'd lost when the crops had been wiped out in Ceylon, uh, a coffee harvest had disappeared, and he'd been sort of financially ruined. He, he took himself to Tasmania at the time of the gold fever. So there was a sense of scratching for gold as a way out of the difficulty, which didn't work or happen at all, and then returning to the garden. So it's his take, then my daughter's take, as if the younger women in The Mental Traveller, um, filled with this energy and dynamism to get through what, uh, what had happened in the colonial period and, and make some kind of restitution by bringing information about what happened to the Ashanika people who didn't know and showing them copies of the contracts which the the government had made with the Peruvian corporation and the contracts they'd made with the missionaries, the Seventh-day Adventists, who were allowed to come in to this land on the understanding that they would stop the native people drinking masato and taking ayahuasca and so on. And, and so there was her energy on one side, the great grandfather on the other, and myself with this sort of poeticized conceit of identifying the journey and the place and weaving the three elements together. And I realized that it was a completely a version of Gold Machine and that, uh, oh, the Gold Machine, sorry, was a version of Mental Traveler. It was my own Mental Traveler at the end of a whole series of other engagements and connections with Blake along the way and the remembrance of George Barker's vision of Blake on the Thames upstream from London and the Conradian visions in London of a, a traveling out to a sort of darkness and the balance between the two, the way that Barker sees a golden angelic form. And he, he says that he, uh, Blake was not writing about angels, he was an angel. Um, all this began to make some kind of sense to me when I spoke and interviewed a very old lady who was part of the Riverside community uh, along the Rio Perenne. Uh, and she was reluctant to talk to us, but because there was a, a younger Ashaninka woman with us and her daughter, the three generations, the old lady, the young child, and the, the woman of middle age, all together, uh, the older woman felt she could talk. 
And I realized even as she talked that this was a perfect demonstration of the equation, the shape of mental traveler that you could see in this flickering firelight. We, it was dark by the time we got there. She came out of a sort of corrugated hut and, and, and had a few twigs that suddenly created this enormous amount of smoke. And she was telling us essentially that in her youth, they had worshipped the fire and stone. And these gods had been set aside by the Adventist missionaries and a new messianic white god had been imposed on them. Uh, but the energies of these older gods were there and this this too was Blakian and, and the most extraordinary thing started to happen which was that even though the fire itself was not making much smoke it seemed that smoke was beginning to come out of her nostrils and the young child fell asleep in the smoke and the the middle woman began to chant and sing um so I'll finish by just reading this little passage, which is the, the mental traveler amazingly entering the shamanic world of the, the upper Amazon. This is, this is a little piece from Gold Machine. And I should say now that this is particularly poignant because in the COVID uh, epidemic, the, the old lady died. The, the, the village was, was cut off. They weren't allowed to. The police sealed the area off and, and several of the elder people we talked to died, including an old man who had actually worked on the coffee plantation in his years. In the smoke thickening dusk among women, we listened to how Bertha talked to Velisa, her soft voice whispering into the heart of the fire. The old lady is seeking in the flickering shadows the recitation that is part of her identity. It was awkward to intrude into the choral exchange of the two women, but I muttered my request to my daughter and she asked Velisa and Velisa asked Bertha. We'd heard about the gods of fire and stone before the coming of the Seventh-day Adventists who now dominated the settlement. We heard about pilgrimages to the salt mountains and pilgrimages to the cave where the bones of the pretender, one Satos Atualpa, also known as a Pinka, were laid. Would Bertha now tell us about this man and her own experiences of visiting the sacred site? Bertha said that her grandmother had seen a pinka when he was carried to a cave, which is now known as Mariscal Caceres. He was buried there together with a mass of gold, which looked like bars of soap. The Ashaninka had their champion on a bed of gold. They brought more and more bars until the, car, the cave was half filled. Over the gold, they put the skin of a cow and then the body of Atualpa. Bertha's grandmother showed her where the cave was to be found, but the old lady does not remember. When the coffee plantation was made, only the owners understood where the cave was hidden. We do not know if the gold is still in the cave or if it's been taken by those who are looking for it. By Spaniards, perhaps. By others who came later, it is possible. Wherever the smoke rises, that is where Marinkama is to be found. It is the smoke of the iron horse, where machetes and cooking pots were forged. So it was until the old ways were lost. When outsiders came, they took away the gold. It disappeared. We don't know where a pinker's gold is. This is what we believed until outsiders and whites came. They ended it all. My grandmother told me about it. She lived in Apinka's presence when she was a child. She was in his service. Here it ends. I am more than 80 years old. My birthday is on the 24th of August. I have six children, three girls and three boys. Um, so there we were with, with a, a realization of where the movement had carried us to a place that gave a shape, which was the shape of Blake's poems, which was a model for everything that followed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ian. Uh, thank you for taking us um, through that uh, 
wonderful journey and the, the twisted threads of time and space that uh, that involved. Um, I mentioned in my introduction um, how you'd made me think a lot about the mental traveler. And I think the, 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 uh, the thing about um, reading things and especially about studying them, and I did my academic Blake back in the 70s, um, is that you, you tend to start to just put things into little boxes. And I remember you know, reading Northrop Fry's Fearful Symmetry, which is really a, you know, is a wonderful early study of Blake that opened it up, opened up the whole field for so many people. And I think it's him that comes up with the orc cycle. And as you mentioned, Foster Damon then, then talks about that. Um, and I think one just starts to say, oh yeah, mental travel, that's the orc cycle. <laughs> and it just made me reevaluate it, reading, reading The Gold Machine. And having read um, of, of various incidents in the, in the history that you unearth and reveal in The Gold Machine, I went back to the poem and I realized how intense the sort of the scene of rape is, where, where he plants himself in every nerve and, and how brutal the scenes of uh, sacrifice, of crucifixion, the taking the heart out of the side. And I'd never, never felt it quite so intensely as when I read about the excesses of uh, colonialism and imperialism. Yeah. And I, it hit me for the first time how and Blake's so good at saying so many things at once and, and somehow in detail on different levels how much the, the cycle of civilizations and uh, you know, one civilization superseding another, places being colonized and then taken back and so on, and all the, all the brutality and pain that that involves in, in cycles and how that, uh, how that works. So it really brought that home to me. And, and again and again, the gold you know, and, the, and the shrieks that are caught in cups of gold with that bleak in synesthesia that you get in London as well where you catch a shriek in a cup um, and, and the sort of the pleasure in the victims, the victim's pain. And that made me think of earlier civilizations of the Inca child sacrifices in Peru and, um, and the Aztecs uh, and, and the, the heart removal and so on. So sort of, uh, yeah, so meticulously performed and done. So Thank you for that, because uh, I think it really helped me to reapproach uh, what Blake is doing through the, the extraordinary complexity and weaving and unweaving of what, what you've done in The Gold Machine. Yeah, thank, thanks very much. Um, and what you've just been saying rings a lot of bells because we, we went to the headquarters of the Franciscan missionaries who'd, who'd taken off into the jungle and uh, when we were there there was a huge mural that had just been commissioned which depicted almost like a graphic novel the events of the original um, monks that went off and how they were slaughtered and tortured and torn apart and and then you know new lives souls coming back as birds crucified figures in the trees all of these things are absolutely like a kind of horror comic based on, on Blake's Mental Traveller, which made perfect sense in the terms of some of the, the kind of uh, Inca and Aztec imagery. The Mayans, as, as um, William Burroughs, you know, looked, looked at the, the books of the Mayan codices, all of these things, bizarrely, are, are quite Blakean or anticipated yeah. by Blake in extraordinary ways. Yes, indeed. If everyone would like to turn their cameras on now, and um, you can use the raised hand uh, icon, which uh, on most uh, editions of Zoom you'll find on the reactions um, part on the uh, on the uh, taskbar at the bottom or wherever it occurs on your screen, and um, yeah, so we can uh, take some questions or comments for Ian would be great. Okay. Just looking for some raised hands, yeah. We're all happy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, oh, yes. 
Gary Stone has a, has a question or a comment. Gary. Muted, Gary. Get you, sis. Thank, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. And that was that was so nourishing. Um, I, I was a book dealer at one time, like yourself, and I've got a couple of inscribed <laughs> Ginsburg books tucked on the back of the, the my Blake shelf, and he inscribes them with R and sunflowers. Yes, 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 yes. And that that's his like what he's leaving you to to see his mark on on that on that book. What just that idea of when you sat with him on the hill, which really really striking image the idea he had that if you chant if you use your physical voice if you use the right word that you can change the world that sort of physical and uh, mental combination one one affecting the other did did you get that from him and how do you see that with the sort of mental traveling and the living in the real world and actually experiencing the landscape does that make sense? Is it is yeah, something no, no, it to makes, explore? It makes, it makes perfect sense. Um, I think I think for him at that stage, because he he'd um, he'd been in India, and when we talked to him first in the garden of the house where he's living near uh, Regent's Park, he the first thing he wanted to talk about was was breathing, um, and the power of breathing and the power of chanting. Um, I feel at that point his his understanding of it, you know, was possibly wasn't exactly scholarly. I mean, it was it was a, a sort of uh, intriguing, and it, it it sat alongside his his connections with various rock musicians, and also his connection with Charles Olson, who he who he'd been at conferences with, and Olson's theories about breath. You know, the whole the whole process of projective verse was an idea that that. Um, the poem was an extension of, of your, your body and how you breathe and your, your thoughts were shaped by this taking in the, the breath of the world. And Ginsberg has, was such a sort of a student, a scholar, if you like, of, of so many different kind of religions and disciplines in, in his quest for vision. And I think the, the defining vision was that Blake moment, but it sent him off onto a into Peru, in fact, you know, in, in, the, in the footsteps of, of Burroughs to undergo, which wasn't pleasant at all, a, a series of ayahuasca experiences, which were pretty grisly and, and showed him the kind of energies of the cosmos. But as a, as a sort of tourist, I, th I felt that a lot of his engagement in those things was slightly touristic, but was, was um, deeply held and he carried on with it as time went on. It became, it became part of his work. And he felt, I felt that he, he wanted to, to undergo all those experiences for the great task, which was the task of becoming a poet, sort of being initiated into the, into the fellowship of the poets, because he made it his business to, to seek out the George Barkers and the, I mean, he, he tried to get hold of Dylan Thomas when he was in New York and um, David Gascoigne, he, he shared time with in Basil Bunting. So, he, he wanted to join this sort of golden fellowship and all, all of it, Blake was, Blake was his sort of mentor and inspiration from this one episode in East Harlem when, when his, his reading gave way to a voice. And, the, and I think the voice returned with other, other poems at a different time. He, he's very keen to sing Blake. And obviously, you know, there's lots of brilliant recordings like The Grey Monk, which is just yeah. astounding. Um, but the, the Blake and songs and the chanting and the fact that Blake sang, which unfortunately we never know, is that is that singing element part of that though? Do you think? Do you yeah. think it's not just sort of, there is that cosm cosmic view about expressing the idea and the thought and the vision yeah. through through the, the the sound and the singing and the chanting as much as the words and the imagery. Well, for sure. I mean, because but that's sort of in, implicit in in the the words on the paper. I mean, the the words themselves sing. The, word, the words they don't they don't lie down dormant. The, the, the words in Jerusalem are actually they're they're chanting. You ha you have to you have to give them your breath. You have to see how they sound. The sounding of the words 
is as important as the design of the words. I mean, Blake was pretty amazing in that he covered both things. He, he had the, 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 the literal vision, the illuminations, the speaking with the dead, and also the, the, the sense of sound, the deep sense of sound being part of the body and part of the city that you could, if you had the right word, knock down the walls of a city. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. as the poets use as a sort of metaphor, but there was a kind of literal sense. And in a way it's true, because if you if you got the words at a sufficient depth, then the walls of Canary Wharf would immediately crumble to dust around you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Tonight's been very nourishing. Thank you. Thank you for this. Thank you very Thank much. You. Blake was um, reputed to have a very melodious voice and, and got a lot of praise from musicians. Mm. He's a, what an accomplished man. Amy Weldon has a question or yeah. comment. Hi. Hi. Um, thank, thank you. I'm a really big fan of your work and I'm really eager to read your, your new book. I'm wondering um, if you could speak about how, as a writer who travels through the layers of London so richly and in so many different ways with Blake alongside you um, as a writer who also knew London. What is it like to write about Peru where to travel with Blake through Peru where at least as far as we know, <laughs> Blake never traveled at least in a physical form. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear you speak about that. Thank you. Uh, uh I'm not sure that I, you know, I, I've written about this travel, but I still don't know if I really did it. <laughs> um, it's quite a strange experience because uh, while, while we were there with my, my daughter making the journey, uh, filmmaker Grant G was accompanying us making his own film, which was completely separate and was pretty much based on an earlier book of mine. And so in his film, I'm not there at all. It's just my daughter and there's an actor who's playing a kind of writer character who's living in a flat on the seashore in St. Leonard's and is in communication with his daughter who's sending back these dispatches. So I saw this film and I thought, well, maybe I wasn't there, you know. The, the difference between the, the book and the film was the film was, did I ever go? And the book was, did I ever get back? Because one of, one of those, you, you know, you asked, did I, did I engage with it or did I, feel completely different in being in somewhere I don't know at all to London, which I've come to know quite well in certain areas. And the strange thing was that I felt we reached a point where you could almost move into this, this other dimension. There, was, there are some um, eight miles of white water cascades, which are very difficult to pass through. And the end of my great grandfather's journey, which is pretty poetically described, they do a 40, 50 mile journey down the river with the, the local uh, chieftain who's never traveled that far on balsa rafts. And they reach the point of the white water and the, the priests who are guiding them disappear, steal all their brandy and disappear into the forest. The indigenous people disappear and they are surrounded by other people with bows and arrows and that's the kind of end, the climax of the story. They're not going through the raft. I felt if I can go back and if I can go through these rapids that he didn't, he's going to be on the other side. You know, there's a sort of plural sense of time, shamanic time, whereby if you want to meet an ancestor, you go to a particular location and you're on equal terms. Time is plural. Chronological linear time only began for these people with the arrival of these infiltrators from outside, these colonialists who set up the plantations. But when we did get there, the arrangements to, to get a boat, everything fell apart until I found a boy with a dugout canoe and he took us into the, for two soles, which is nothing, he kind of paddled it into the rapids, but it was impossible to get through and complete the journey. So essentially, I kind of got the sense that I'd I, I didn't come back and I, I'm still there and I'm hooked in this country. There's more to be more to be taken out of it. But what we found was that the, the local people believed that on the far side, the reason you don't go through these rapids, not only that it's dangerous and not only that there's remnants of shining path on the far side of it. And there are a lot of narco dealers in the forests. Um, there's a whirlpool of dead ancestors. It's described as a source 
circular swirl of water, which would be where all of your ancestors are perpetually spinning around. And those kind of um, ideas and metaphors were something I can't get easily in London. <laughs> so there is a there was a there was a sort of sense of um, release in, into a, into a different way of writing, because there's always got to be some way of getting out of any one of these London books into the next one. <clears throat> Um, with, with with the M25 circuit, which could be eternal, you know, you could go, go around it forever. It was only when we hit Epping Forest and passed the asylum where John Clare was was kept that the, the way out became obvious that we'd have to follow John Clare's <clears throat> wonderful journey out of Essex, this extraordinary walk when he's trying to connect with his muse, Mary Joyce, who's already dead. And so where do you find your muse? Your muse is there somewhere. For Claire, it was this, this terrible journey that ended up with his enclosure, his, his imprisonment in Northampton Asylum for the rest of his life. Um, and there was this wonderful moment that never quite happened when Claire came to London for the first time from his village in um, what was then um, Northamptonshire. He was living very, very close, staying very close to where Blake was in Fountain Court. They were, they were there at the same time. And Claire was quite fond of having a drink. And I think Blake used to go out and get some porter in the evening. It was just a phenomenal idea that the two paths could somehow have met because they, they both, for me, have had defining journeys. They, they both had mental travels and, and actual physical travels. Um, Blake, of course, has been a sort of cosmic traveler without ever covering much geographical ground in his lifetime. Claire walked enormous distances, um, but his, his journey only ended up with him trapped in a, in a single space and having to, to unhitch himself, as it were, from his own ego and, and become various other people. And I think that was what I was trying to do in Peru was to sort of unhitch myself from the ego of knowledge about London and going into somewhere that was unknown with an, a dead ancestor as my, as my sole guide and a daughter as a prompt and a sort of moral conscience to keep us moving and looking at the realities in social, economic and political terms. And keeping me aware of cultural appropriation and all those other things that we're always guilty of as old white people. Thank you. Do we have any more? Uh, ah, yes. Gareth, Gareth Henstone Sturdy. Uh, thanks very much. And, and thanks, Ian. Uh, another fantastic uh, set of stories from you this evening. Um, it's a, it's a, Simple question for me, I, I think, which is it first it was London and, and then it was out to the south coast and then it was out to the Gower <laughs> and now it's out to Peru. I'm just uh, wondering, dare we imagine what remoteness you might uh, be seeking next? Is, is, have you somewhere in mind even further beyond Peru? Um, no, not really. Um... You know, who knows? Who knows what what uh, travels are allowed? Uh, it, was, it was before before I did the Peru thing, which was which was pushed into me really by my my daughter's you know saying you've been talking about this a long time. I I want to I really want to do it. I'm going to do a podcast, and the only time I've got with kids in school, whatever is I've got two two weeks. Or, oh no, I've got three four weeks in the summer. Um, that's the time we're going to do it and I said oh, oh god I want to do this book about so no, no okay do it we, so we do it and it turned out to be exactly the same dates as my great-grandfather had done it we did it if we hadn't done it at that moment it would have been impossible because everything immediately closed down for Covid and the kind of projects that were cooking for me before this that I was I was toying with were European ones rather I done a book called The Last London and I felt that was the end of that sequence in the sense that a particular kind of London 
was no longer accessible and there were new kinds of London emerging which would need different ways of writing about, which I was probably not qualified to do. And I, I, was, I was really interested in doing something partly in Sweden, partly in Belgium, partly in Sicily from journeys that I'd already done. And I had a, quite an intense period of journeying. And of course I couldn't, you know, I, I couldn't have done, couldn't do that anyway. But one of the, one of the interesting ones is um, in, in Belgium was this writer called Guy Vass, who, who was um, living in a Flemish part, but I think he was publishing very much in French. And he, during the war, the Second World War, was forced to stay indoors a lot of the time during the occupation. And there was a library of books which happened to be English. So he started obsessively to read about England and especially London. And he developed a kind of really visionary sense of London and, and wrote books and essays in a sort of Borgesian way by London without ever going there. And eventually his wife said, this is preposterous, you know, you've written all this stuff, it's London, it's only it's a couple of hours away, go, for God's sake, go there. And so he did, and he, he arrived in 1975, which was the very, or four, 1974, five, around the time exactly when I was working as a gardener in Limehouse and talking about Hawksmoor churches and so on. He arrived in London and did a book of photographs stalked around these journeys in exactly the places where I was at the same time. And it was un uncanny to find there was this version of what I was doing, but conjured up somehow by somebody who lived in, in Belgium and had arrived here to a London of fantasy, but had found himself photographing pyramids in St. Anne's Limehouse, photographing Abney Park, uh, places he didn't know at all, just randomly came across. So I uh, kind of confirmed me in a sense that there, there is a sort of London that is available through wandering with no sense of anything other than the writers that you, you've enjoyed and admired. And, and hopefully um, one, one of these accounts, which has never been done in English, is going to be translated. I've got a, a poet called... Uh, a friend from, from Brussels, Adolfo Barbera, coming over tomorrow. And he's, um, he's hoping to, to get a publisher, you know, who will, who will make this transition. So I, lo I love that sense. And I thought maybe, you know, in a sense, I can some, turn it into reverse. And I, I can start to write about places I don't really know, you know, in, in uh, Gothenburg and... Um, Brussels and Palermo and so on and, and tease out something but it, it's come to a bit of a stop because of the way the world is and the other side of it is I've, I've kind of gone back into into doing more of the, the sort of poetry I started with um, you know which is really there to be read by about five people if I'm lucky <laughs> but which gives me a complete freedom to write any way I want to rather than have this sense of anybody looking over your shoulder with the mainstream publication, which I think is getting more and more difficult anyway, for the sort of things that I write. Kevin Mannering. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Ian, for your fascinating talk. It was um, really interesting to hear how you, in effect, de-territorialize yourself by um, absconding to Peru and I just wonder whether like it is possible for Blake to be deterritorialized as well whether he resonated in Lima as much as he does in London or whether he's seen in Congress there or, or whether there was some sort of interesting symmetry going on uh, between his cosmological vision and you know perhaps even that, that kind of Peruvian cosmological vision yeah. Uh, were there any in interesting resonances going on there, or did he seem to be out of place, a fish out of water? No, he he didn't he didn't seem out of place. I mean, a lot of a lot, I think, in, in the way that I kind of ended up, the, a lot of the the ideas and images and metaphors that are, that are ripe and rich in Blake and in his imagery are certainly available in the more 
uh, indigenous areas rather than the I found in in the sort of I, I mean not that I spent a lot of time in Lima, but but the the circles that we've touched on there, Blake would have seemed very different. But again, um, uh, his his ideas, his visions would could be related to some things I saw in in some of the churches there. Some sort of astonishingly energetic images that drew on several cultures. But where I where I found Blake echoing was not um, from a previous trip was in in um, Santiago in, in yeah. Chile because I'd, I'd gone there and there were some people who really intensely read English literature um, uh, also knew Roberto Bolaño and so there was a there was a, a cache a cache there of sort of hidden Blakeianism that was uh, uh, people directly who, who would have known about Blake and there were there were books in, in very good bookshops and, and tatty old copies falling apart in, in kind of more obscure market stalls and things so I kind of saw a presence of him there but I didn't I didn't literally get any direct connections in Peru but it was only coming back home again thinking about it I, I began to see the whole thing in a very Blakean light. Mm, that's interesting. What about um, the art, though? Uh, the iconography over there, did it in some way echo or mirror some of Blake's art, you know? Um, well, I didn't, you know, I, you know, obviously, I, I didn't actually see much contemporary art. I only, the only places I saw it which mirrored it in a, in a sort of fairly crude way was this convent where a new, this new mural had been commissioned of what could have been an illustration to the mental traveller in that there were people mm -hmm. shrieking golden cups crucifixions um, old women and children you know all, all of that stuff was there in a that surrounded you entirely because it went around the entire room so you could actually walk through the geography of something that was like a comic strip version on ayahuasca of mental traveller um, good heavens the, the standard Ooh. art that was there was nothing like it was like there was a a religious art, you know, um, the saints in a, in a fairly dour, uh, varnish darkness, undergoing their torments. But they weren't they weren't ecstatic. There was no sort of ecstatic release. But the that art was, and um, I think you know it, it 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 could if you see the film that Grant G made when it comes out, also called the Gold Machine. There's a sequence of these images that that you look at and you'll think ah. It's a kind of pop Blake. <laughs> what about the pictographic qualities of the codices? Uh, do they I didn't see? I mean, I didn't echo see. Blake's art. Uh, yes, yeah, I think they do. They do. They do in the sense of, of the book being like an uh, you know uh, an illustrated uh, testament of some sort with, with visionary images in and. Uh, but I just didn't. I didn't see any of that. You know, it wasn't it wasn't part of this particular journey. I didn't have time. It still sounds amazing. Thank you very much. I look forward to the book. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, we have some uh, we have some wonderful Blake translators um, who have been online with us recently for an event um, from Brazil and from Poland. And the I think one may at least yes is online now. And um, I thought, how interesting will it be, Blake, you know, translating Blake? But it was incredibly interesting because, of course, the uh, intense attention that they were paying to words, to meanings, and, uh, and finding those shades of meanings threw up all sorts of uh, new insights and new thoughts, which was fantastic. Ah, any other comments or questions? There's some people out here who are great greatly into your work. I'm sure they'd like to ask something. Yes, it's John Reardon. John, please. Hello. Hi. Um, thank you, Ian. That's um, extraordinarily interesting. Um, this is a slightly half-formed thought, and um, forgive me, but um, I was intrigued by your idea of um, getting to Epping Forest and escaping uh, beyond the M25. And it made me think, uh, we, we think of Blake as this great London poet, but in a sense, was he, was he trapped by London in some sense? I know there was um, an attempt to, to early in his career to pay for him to go to Europe 
which didn't come off. And then obviously wars with France made that impossible. And then he only, the only time of any significance, he sort of went beyond London to Felpham, mm. ended in a horrible disaster. So in a way, was he, you know, did he have to become this great poet of London because that was his his stomping ground, literally, and and perhaps to our benefit. But well, would he be a different kind of poet, I suppose? Well, it's a much more porous stomping ground in a sense. You know, you you could you could you could walk out of it fairly mm. easily. You know, but by the time you're you've you've crossed the river and you've done a few miles, you're you're up in the Surrey Hills. You're you're out there and going you're going down to Shoreham you're you're well out of there and it's it's easily done so he he comes out you know he breaks through the terrible necklace of where the m25 would be a few times but in a sense i think being in felpham was like being the prison of not being in london even though it had its its exhilaration initially the 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 other pressures called him called him or hauled him back where he had to be maybe maybe he was a kind of prisoner of london which the pressure of that may have contributed to the, the width of his vision and the intensities of his experiences i mean if, if he was if he was a prisoner of london then then this was turned to being a benefit he certainly wasn't a tourist yeah Not do you even, think he he would can you envisage a uh, an alternate reality Blake where he got to go other places and would you, presumably oh, really? he would have been a very different artist. Um, no, you know, in the way that <laughs> Wordsworth or whatever could could uh, because because it's a kind of class and and education and money thing was able to take himself off to to France and experience elements of the French Revolution, but but Blake. Um, did it in a, in a in extraordinary poems instead experienced it as deeply in a different way mm. i can't see him on the sort of grand grand tour of italy sort of humping and spluttering over certain things and uh, we enjoying michelangelo as well or whatever i mean you know you, you can do it someone may well do a, a novel of blake on his travels at some point Ugh, I, I don't think we can even think about it. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, John. Yeah. He does write about um, London before he goes to Felpham, doesn't he? Um, Ian, as, a, as the dark net, and it's, it's in very, very dark terms. It's holding him back, and he shakes it off and shakes the dust off his wings. And Felpham is a wonderful at first. I okay. think it does open him up to uh, nature in a new way, and the sea. I think results in Tharmas and the Zoas. And uh, it was very important to to do that once at least, you know, to have that experience. In the same way that, that John Clare, I think, only ever saw the sea once. Uh, <laughs> when when things were already pretty much up with him and his books had fallen out of fashion, he had a sack of books. He looked like a figure in a in a Blake engraving and he tramped to Boston. <laughs> and gave a talk, not Boston, USA, Boston on, on near the wash and, and climbed up to the church tower and saw the sea. I think the only time that he saw it. But it was important, you know, it was, it was like, have it confirmed. Yeah, it must be a revelation, truly. I think, and if I remember correctly, I think Blake was um, aiming for, uh, to go to, to Europe, but they couldn't raise the money. And it all fell away and others went and he was he was left behind but um mm. he seems he does seem well yeah perhaps it's uh perhaps it's to stereotype him to think of him so rooted in in london and in albion but uh that's that so much comes through so strongly doesn't it do we have any other questions oh or comments I think we, oh yes, it's Tim. Tim, speak to us. Thank you, Ian. I was fascinated by the transition from place to movement to shape. And it recalled, I once had a visit from Lawrence Ferlinghetti into the rooms in South Walton Street where Blake lived. Mm. And his great, 
movement to place resulted in a shape. He asked for a sheet of paper <laughs> and some ink and some brushes. And he just drew this painting, this drawing of the angel of desire on fire. <laughs> and it resonated with mm -hmm. the theme of your talk tonight. And what happened to that drawing? Oh, I, I, um, I burnt it. <laughs> no, I, I still have it. <laughs> I still have it. I'll send you a copy. Oh, I'd love to see it. Yes, yeah. Everyone, I think we're coming to the end of this evening's talk. So on behalf of the Blake Society, I would like to thank Ian Sinclair. I think as a gift, we should buy Ian a ticket on these new low earth orbit flights so that <laughs> Ian can escape gravity and discover a new shape, the shape <laughs> of an orbiting space aircraft. And so with thanks to Ian and thanks to everyone tonight for coming, we will close the meeting tonight. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Lovely. Nice Thank to see you. you. Thanks so much. Wonderful.